What do you think, Harry? Harry? Hey there guys, Nordic Warrior here, welcome back to my video game review series. So those of you who have been following my channel recently will know that I've been reviewing every Harry Potter video game. In my last video I talked about the Half-Blood Prince from 2009. Today we're going to be looking at the sequel, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, released in 2010, developed by EA. So those of you who saw my previous Harry Potter reviews will know that the series had been consistently pretty good at least by the standard of movie license games. Some of the early games in the series were fantastic, and even the ones that weren't the best I still had fun with. The Goblet of Fire being the only major exception, with that game being incredibly generic and tedious. With the Order of the Phoenix and the Half-Blood Prince games both taking the series back to its RPG roots, and both being solid, well-received games, you would have expected EA to continue that trend and make The Deathly Hallows Part 1 a similar kind of game but with some more innovation and better overall technicalities. Well unfortunately rather than stick with what worked and add some new and exciting gameplay mechanics with improvements on what was already there, EA decided instead to make The Deathly Hallows Part 1 a linear Gears of War style third person shooter with a Harry Potter paint job. This game, yeah, it's disappointing. So like I said, the game is a third-person shooter based on the seventh Harry Potter movie. Just like the rest of the games in the series, it follows the story of the movie pretty loosely. Just like the movie, the game begins with Voldemort giving Snape and his other followers instructions and planning to ambush Harry. There have been too many mistakes where Harry Potter is concerned. Tonight, I will kill Harry Potter. You start the game off with an on-rail shooter where Harry has to ride along with Hagrid to be transported to the safe house at the borough. During the flight, Harry and Hagrid are ambushed by hordes of flying Death Eaters and Harry will have to shoot them out the sky. This is the only rail shooter section in the game and while it's nothing special, it does at least look pretty cool. That's one of the things that this game can certainly lay claim to. It looks great. The graphics and presentation, as well as the character models, do look very good, and are certainly an improvement over the last game. If I was to grade this game purely on its visual aesthetic, it would rank very highly with me. Once the rail shooter flight is over, Harry arrives at the borough and you get a short cutscene, then an introduction into the game's overall combat and gameplay mechanics. You can tell right off the bat that this game was heavily inspired by the likes of Gears of War, and other third-person shooters of its kind. You spend the vast majority of the game traversing certain locations from the movie, dodging and shooting waves and waves of Death Eaters and Snatchers, as Harry and his friends attempt to locate and destroy Horcruxes just like in the movie. As far as the shooting mechanics go, just like in Gears of War, you can target enemies with your guns, <laughs> I mean spells, and you take them out one at a time. The game has a cover mechanic with lots of conveniently placed barriers for you to hide behind and shoot from. These are everywhere. Enemies will often take cover too, and there will often be plenty of them on screen at once. This is fun for about 5 minutes, then it becomes a complete chore. And when you start to realise that this is practically all the game has to offer, it starts to get very tedious. You defeat enemies by casting spells at them. There are several spells to unlock throughout the game. You start the game off with Stupefy, the standard attack spell. This constitutes the vast majority of the game's combat, and if truth be told, I used this pretty much exclusively during combat, because all the other spells in the game pretty much suck, and I just found Stupefy to be the most efficient to use in combat. You have Expulso, which is another attack spell that I personally found pretty useless compared to Stupefy. It's basically like a machine gun that sucks and barely does any damage. You have Protego for casting shields. This can be used to deflect enemy spells to help you avoid taking damage. You have Confundo that confuses enemies and causes them to attack each other. This is quite useful for dealing with multiple enemies, but sadly it doesn't last very long and 
you're probably better off just relying on Stupefy. You have Expelliarmus that is like a shotgun blast. You have Petrificus Totalis for freezing enemies. You have Confringo which can be used to blow up certain obstacles in your path. And can even be used to drop multiple enemies to the ground. You have Wingardium Leviosa, which I barely used at all, just to levitate items. And you have Expecto Patronum, which is used to ward off and defeat Dementors. You also have Finite Incantatum, which is used exclusively to free captured Muggleborns. And you have a spell called Four Points, which is used to help show you the way to your next objective. As I mentioned before, you will most likely be relying on Stupefy for the vast majority of the game, as it's just convenient to do so. To select your spells you have a spell wheel that you can bring up at any time to switch between spells. In addition to spells you also have various potions and concoctions to find and use throughout the game. These include exploding potions and smoke bombs that can be thrown at enemies. These can be useful but again if truth be told you could just as easily ignore these altogether for the most part and just rely on stupefy. Seriously, Stupefy might as well have been the name of this game, Harry Potter and the Stupefy or something like that. You can also pick up health potions as well as liquid luck doses, although these really don't appear to make much of a difference, or at least I couldn't notice much of a difference with them. While blasting through waves and waves of Death Eaters and Snatchers, you will occasionally come across other enemy types, as well as cutscenes to convey the story. The game has some enemy variety, but not as much as in previous games. The vast majority of the time you fight Death Eaters and Snatchers, but occasionally you will have to fight Dementors. These can be defeated by using Expecto Patronum, which can affect all nearby Dementors. You also come across Doxies that can be defeated by throwing Doxyside at them and shooting them. You also come across these horrible creatures called Inferi. These try to swarm you and bring you to the ground and cannot be defeated, so you will just have to try and avoid them. But you can stun them to help you avoid them. You also fight giant spiders at certain points in the game. The combat of the game is incredibly tedious, and to top it all off, the enemy AI is pretty awful. For example, at certain points in the game you can actually run past enemies, avoiding combat altogether, and they will seemingly just forget about you. Not gonna lie, I did this many times because the combat in the game, I was just so bored of it, it got so repetitive and tedious. In addition to combat, which takes up the vast majority of the game, you do have some other features. For example, in a few areas you will have to use stealth to complete a particular objective. You can use Harry's invisibility cloak throughout the entire game, and this can be used in most areas. This lets you sneak past enemies. You also have a mechanic where you can take down enemies from behind while using stealth. Now this sounds cool, doesn't it? But unfortunately this feature is broken. Out of places to hide. Which will soon. Oh, thank you. We'll be safe now. For example, the stealth takedown will very rarely work because the game gives you a meter that runs out as you move while in the cloak. Once the meter runs out, Harry will just remove the cloak and you can be spotted right away. This also happens when you get too close to an enemy, and this is something you need to do before taking them out from behind. And to top it off, taking out an enemy using stealth will still result in Harry removing the cloak and any other enemies nearby will likely be alerted to you. So yeah, the stealth mechanic, while interesting and a good idea, was not very well executed. The game is very short, and one of the tactics used to pad out the game is that between certain sections of the story, you will be given three side missions to undertake. You can choose what order to do them in, but you will still have to do them all anyway. For example, sneaking around the Ministry to rescue Muggleborns, or even sneaking into a dragon's cave and trying to get past the dragon, which is a Hungarian horntail like in the Goblet of Fire. Why Harry would be doing this, I have no idea, but I digress. These side missions are just as boring as the rest of the game, and they don't make any sense story-wise. The game has several boss battles. For example, you take on Voldemort briefly during the opening rail section. You take on Dolores Umbridge, Scabia, Nagini, the Locket Horcrux, and you also get a final battle against Bellatrix and the Malfoy family. Pretty much all of these suck, but they do add some variety to the game. The game does have several collectibles to find. For example, you can find Potter Watch passwords. These each unlock a radio recording done by Fred and George, as they update Harry and the DA members on the events of the story. Serious. Apologies. 
apologise for our temporary absence from the airways, which is due to a number of house calls in our area by those charming Death Eaters. But now we're back. So let's move to news concerning the wizard who is proving just as elusive as Harry Potter. We'd like to refer to him as Chief Death Eater. These are quite fun to listen to. We now turn to Rita Skeeter's new biography of Albus Dumbledore. Have you got a coffee rapier? Of course. And I highly recommend it to all our listeners who need something to blow their nose on. About the only use for it by all accounts. You also have daily profits that can be found scattered around the game in suitcases. These each will contain a headline from the paper that you can read from the menu. You can also find copies of the Quibbler which do the same thing. In addition to these collectibles you also have these Deathly Hallow symbols which are quite well hidden. And you can find these at various different points in the game. The game also supposedly has a leveling up system. As you play through the game, Harry's level will increase and the game will indicate that your spells are now more powerful. However, despite this, I never once noticed a single difference in spell power at any time during the game. No matter how much I leveled up, it seemingly made no difference. Throughout the game I was constantly getting these indications and not noticing a single difference. It makes me wonder if the developers actually forgot to add this. So yeah, the leveling up system in the game is completely pointless. So the combat and overall gameplay pretty much sucks, and the game seemingly has several broken features. What else is there? The story and voice acting. That we at the Quibbler fully supported Dumbledore during his lifetime, and in his death, support you just as fully. Uh, thanks. Is Luna with you? She lingered in that charming little garden. Yeah, these are a bit of a letdown too. The voice acting and cutscenes here feel so rushed and anticlimactic. Even some of the more emotional scenes from the movie are like this. Dobby is happy to be with his friend, Harry Potter. <laughs> Seriously, you will be following Dean and Griphook while blasting away hordes of enemies, when all of a sudden this happens. Harry. You destroyed one Horcrux, right? Tom Riddle's diary. With the Basilisk Fang. When you stabbed the Basilisk, the sword took in some of its venom. So, the sword? The sword can destroy Horcruxes? Brilliant. But unless I've got it wrong, Gryffindor's sword is a fake. It's just like the Horcruxes. No one knows where the real sword is. Did you think we'd be finding a Horcrux every other day? You're supposed to be the one with the plan. You said we should do what Dumbledore wanted. Only Dumbledore didn't tell you anything, did he? Take off the locket, please, Ron. You wouldn't be talking like this if you hadn't been wearing it. Yeah, I would. And so would you if you were honest. Go home, then. If you're so unhappy, go home to Mummy. Just leave the Horcrux. Ron! Stop! You staying? Or coming? Ron! No! Please! Seriously, there was no build-up to that whatsoever, and it just comes out of nowhere. Yeah, the dialogue in the game is just as rushed as the rest of it. Some of it is pretty funny though, I must admit. You must not hurt Harry Potter! You dirty little monkey! How dare you take a witch's wand! How dare you defy your masters! The only positive I can really think of with this game is the graphics. It looks great, one of the best looking games in the entire series, and for 2010 it still holds up today. As I mentioned before, the shooting mechanics are fun at first, but the novelty wears off very quickly. The game is a massive disappointment, and it's just a real shame because the previous games in the series all had plenty of exploration, and RPG elements that were genuinely fun. I give The Deathly Hallows Part 2 a massively disappointing 2 out of 10. I'm actually not sure what's worse, this or The Goblet of Fire. Both games suck and I actually think this one might have been more tedious. Let me know what you guys think. Stay tuned for my next video where we're going to be looking at the sequel and the final game in the mainline Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and The Deathly Hallows Part 2, as well as many more retrospective video game reviews. Thanks for watching and God bless.